Hello and welcome to this independence edition of uh, News 18 presents Yuva Bharat in association with IIMUN. And today we have somebody, when he talks, everybody listens. And uh, who best uh, and better than Dr. Subramanian Swami, who's seen India pass through so many phases to talk about Bharat where it is at 74 and into the throes of the 75th year of independence, where and how we need to set our ideals so that we are somewhere when we complete 100 years of our independence in 2047. Dr. Swami, namaste. Always namaste. a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, yes, Thank you very much. Uh, and then we have members of IMR, former, current, some who, are, uh, who started with the dream and now are entering into its 10th year as its uh, founder and president. Rishabh Shah is there. Utsav, Aman, and Darpan, welcome. Thank you very much. The floor yeah. is all yours. But yes. my, I'm just going to sneak in my first question, take the liberty of being the anchor today <laughs> and ask Dr. Dr. Swami, what is your idea of Bharat? Let's start from there. Well, uh, in uh, Bharat is an ancient country. It's not a country that has been put together recently or in uh, 1947. Uh, the name in Bharat itself is very, very ancient. Uh, we have uh, um, two, two concepts. Uh, one is what we call as the Republic of India. And... Uh, and that is called Bharat. And then we have the identity of India, which we is popularly called all over the world, including in Islamic countries as Hindustan. Uh, the word Hindu, it did not come from as uh, the British propagated and we are just uh, repeating. It did not come from the word Sindhu, which they can't pronounce as uh, Sir, so they said Hindu. It's actually a Sandhi of two words. Uh, just like Dravida is a Sandhi of two words, which I'll come to later. But uh, Himalayas, he and the Hindu sagas, Hindu, uh, that Sandhi is uh, called Hindu. And Hindu is essentially anyone who's resident in, from uh, Kanyakumari to Kashmir. And uh, that is the uh, concept. And we have demonstrated that's a real concept because we are one of the few countries which has not reduced in size. Of course, there are some parts which are in foreign occupation. But uh, you take uh, Pakistan, it has broken into two. It could easily break into four in the future. Uh, you see uh, Soviet Union broke into 16, uh, Indonesia into two, Yugoslavia into four. Although India was predicted as the favorite candidate for breaking up, but India did not. And uh, in 1962, when the Chinese attacked India, the, most people thought India would fall apart, that the DMK will uh, secede, et cetera, uh, from uh, Tamil Nadu, from uh, India. But the exact opposite happened. There was a huge rise in, in, mm. uh, in, uh, in nationalism. The same thing we saw in, uh, in, uh, in the, after the emergency when Mrs. Gandhi declared uh, elections. Uh, people who traditionally most voted on caste, religion, cut across, in, uh, especially in the most uneducated part of India, that is North India, uh, and voted so heavily for, against Mrs. Gandhi that she couldn't get a single seat in, uh, in, in North India, while the educated South voted for Mrs. Gandhi, and we all hang our head in shame being from South India, at least you and me. <laughs> so... Uh, therefore, uh, this, uh, this country has demonstrated its durability. The second durability which has been demonstrated is uh, for almost uh, 600 years, the Islamic rule was quite widespread, not uh, in the entire country, but uh, they, it was quite widespread. And uh, thereafter, the British uh, were there formally 100 years uh, from 1857. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, they were more or less uh, in, in indirect control for uh, a total of 200 years. And yet, uh, <clears throat> India was able to get rid of both of them. Whereas you see Iran, which was a great civilization, the Zoroastrian civilization. After Islam uh, invaded that country, within 15 years, they had converted the entire population, uh, which was uh, alive, uh, to Islam. And same thing with Mesopotamia, Babylon, which is now known as Iraq, Egypt. Uh, the Christians uh, converted Europe uh, to Christianity in 50 years. 
but this country is has couldn't be completely uh, not even completely not even substantively uh, converted so therefore this uh, uh, the uh, hindu culture more mm-hmm. than the religion because religion is, uh, is you know we don't have a book and we don't have uh, a god and or a prophet and uh, so on we have multiple of these things so this country has functioned as uh, john galbraith once said uh, that this is a functioning democracy uh, it's a functioning anarchy i go on road we all shut our eyes the americans used to tell me in those days when i was first went to america uh, but it functions and it has functioned it has survived it has survived a horrible food crisis in 1965 it survived a terrible uh, foreign exchange crisis when everybody was predicting is going to be a collapse and that's in the late 80s and it is you know if you go through history famines so many things have happened but india is a great survivor and i think that's the uh, the benchmark for india right right sir. so uh, you did mention about your idea of india and it is uh, your idea of bharat and uh, it's it's one perspective and so you did mention also about 600 years of muslim rule so before i just get to the questions and before i involve aman that one and also um a lot of people regard those 600 years as not muslim rule where because the idea would be that you know they integrated into a culture they okay. became a part of india and that is what a lot of people would like to believe that 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 rajya sultan was as much indian as as probably some of today's leaders are why do you say that in your idea of india or your idea of bharat that 600 years need to be eliminated per se i don't know which history book you have been reading i don't think they integrated with with the culture that existed in india mm. and you know it's not very wise to uh, sort of document uh, what all happened because we want to forget some of that uh but the fact is that uh, i always ask uh, my muslim friends and i have some in fact i have a relative who's a muslim my daughter married a muslim and the, and the the family is a very distinguished family and uh, my and the uh, my, my daughter's father in law was actually foreign secretary and ambassador and so on salman haider but uh, i have had very frank discussions with them and uh, i just asked them one question which labagas them be go to go, jaipur the rani raja there can trace their ancestry uh you go to um, uh, gwalior the same thing all over you go you go to uh, tamil nadu you can see ramnath raja's uh, descendants but nobody is today can trace uh, who what is left of the mogals they ruled 600 years but then why is it that you don't see any of their uh, the descendants and uh, nizam had 114 wives but uh, of hyderabad but uh, their descendants are more or less scattered gone away so uh, there is a fundamental difference between muslim rule christian or uh, british rule and the hindu rule because the hindu rule was not based on the mogal emperor or the uh, christian uh, uh, queen victoria or something like that. it was the 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 king had to submit to those who are knowledgeable people and uh, brahmins by the way are not born and that lord krishna makes it very clear yeah. in the gita it's a yeah. it's a it's a, if you are a gyani and tyagi you are a brahmin and you can be from any any for instance vishwamitra was born in a kshatriya family uh well, vidya was uh, his mother was a fisher woman you know yeah i i got kalidas i was a vanvasi uh, most, most people say that uh, 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 valmiki was valmiki. a dalit yeah and uh, so um, this caste being and the caste, first of all the caste is wrong we have varna and we have jati jati is mainly yeah. for wedding so that you don't uh, create dna problems uh, in the marriage uh and uh, some crude varieties of that were the cap in uh, haryana so therefore uh we uh, were never divided on caste region etc etc 
Sanskrit was the vocabulary of every language. Some have more, some have less. Even uh, so the Tamil has 40% word Sanskrit. Uh, once I had an argument with Karuna Nidhi, and I, then I told him, your name itself is Sanskrit, Karuna and Nidhi. So where is this question that Tamil has no Sanskrit words? Then he said, no, the Sanskrit stole these words from Tamil. I said, well, it doesn't matter, but the fact is that, and Malayalam, my God, uh, the extent of Sanskrit words must be 80, 90%. Bengali, uh, others have 60. I mean, Kannada, uh, uh, Kannada has 60%. So Sanskrit was the language by communication interstate. It was not a language of the state, but it is a language of this. Uh, and the vocabulary for science and all came from Sanskrit. So they were, you know, it's a kind of a decentralized unity which has survived, which made you survive. We don't recognize it because you've been reading the wrong history books. Deep, these, these are, deep falsified, deep falsified well, history books. Well, history, well like, in, like in, the, in the Bhagavad Gita, he was, uh, Dr. Swami was saying, so even there he says, Chatur Varna Mama Shrishta. That means that these are the four Varnas which have been created by me only. And then he says it is based on Guna Karma, Guna and yeah. Karma, that is ability and your work, deed. So one is what your mental ability is, and then your physical deeds. And that's what defines who you are. So you're never born a Brahmin, a Vaishya, a Shudra, or, or a Kshatriya. You, right. It is based on your deeds. So if you, uh, if, you, if you have a quest for knowledge, if you learn and you get Jnana, then you become a Brahmin. And the whole idea of Brahman is those who understand the, uh, who, who have the quest to understand the universe. That is Brahmanda or Brahmana, so, so, uh, or, or, or the source of Brahman. So that's yeah. where it all comes, and he explains it in the Gita. Yeah. But go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I see. The, this precisely uh, what I wanted to say. You have said it in different words. The fact of the matter is that uh, uh, we are one people, and that has been proved by DNA. That's uh, people are uh, pounced on poor Mr. Mohan Bhagwat of the RSS for saying they're all the same DNA. All our uh, Indians with the peripheral changes, you know, deviations, very, very peripheral deviations. I have the same DNA, whether they're in Kashmir or in Kanyakumari. Um, the fact that it is one nation is indisputable, but before I delve further into, uh, you know, about the Mughals and the, the English and, uh, and colonialism and so on and so forth, and the questions that I have, let me go to the, let me go to the panelists and let me first start with that one uh, on his questions that he asked for. Uh, so thanks, thanks, Rishabh. Yes. Um, thank you for entertaining these questions, Dr. Swami. I, I just want to touch upon this point. I mean, this is more of a personal sort of question with regards to our identity. I know you speak a lot on, on the identity of, of modern India and young Indians and, and realizing where we come from and things like that. Uh, this idea of colonialism is, you know, highly debated and discussed in universities all over the world. Anywhere there's policy in politics, economics. Colonialism always finds its way in. And we're always debating, especially South Asian countries, whether we've managed to remove ourselves from the colonizers. Are we far enough away? Is it far enough in our history that we now have our, our own identity? Is there really any way to dissociate? Is there any point to discuss dissociation from that identity? Or should we just be figuring out how to use it to our advantage and, and move on ahead? Why, why do we need to know all this? Well, I don't want you to know it, but I will, I will propagate it. There are people who want to learn. They want to ask me, they ask me, what was India? Was India one country? Why is it that we are so much invaded and taken over? And I put that all in perspective. I one day I asked an audience in Gujarat, have you heard of the Ahom dynasty? Nobody heard of them. Ahom dynasty was almost most of the Northeast defeated the Mughals eight times. They tried to cross over and go into the Southeast Asia, but they didn't allow, and they were known as a Hindu kingdom. Although they originally were, uh, they came from Thailand, married here, mingled here, and then ultimately uh, they created a, a, a kingdom. So uh, we don't know our correct history. From where do you get this Aryan business? There's no word Aryan at all. But at the moment, <laughs> I'm saying that it's an ancient country. It was the most developed country. 
it uh, was invaded for its wealth and it fought and fought and fought and ultimately became free. And uh, then after that, we have, because of the, um, our woolly, woolly headed uh, approach to problems, so starting with Jawaharlal Nehru, we have not done the economic development we need to do. The country, I remember I was isolated, attacked, um, ostracized by people like Amartya Sen because I said India can grow faster than China and it can grow at 10% per year. And Narsimha Rao proved that you can grow at least 8% per year. When the people used to laugh, uh, you know, derisively laugh, Hindu rate of growth, which is what? 3.5% per year. Now nobody talks about 3.5% per year. So therefore I'm saying that uh, my, once your mind becomes absolutely clear who we are, you will not have these problems that you raised. So, so I really look up to you about your ideology towards your knowledge and everything. So you, you being a PhD in economics from Harvard and everything. So why is it that today in front of the youth, you talking about those old Shastras, your Hindu <laughs> and everything. So that the youth, honestly, we don't want to hear all those things. The youth is filled with questions regarding current situation of the country where nobody is answering from your end. And it's really glad wow. that you as a spokesperson of the BJP is coming forward and uh, for the debates and everything. But yet the topic is not what we are actually interested in. Yeah. Why I, again, again blame yeah. things on them? You talk about your existence, about your Hindu. Other. So honestly, we're not interested in that. We are well, Ucha, Ucha, one thing, one second, Ucha, uh, you know, it's a question. So I'm going to make it as I'm going to request you to turn it into a question. Your question is that where are the real issues and why are we talking about exactly. uh, uh, issues, or issues of the past? See, the past is something which we are, which is reflecting in our present. So we need to, first of all, have a clarity about what our past is. And secondly, there is a past which we all need to know because of the depth of knowledge and the, and, and the amount of information which is there, which will also guide us into the future. But Dr. Swami, the real issues today uh, into the 75th year of independence, are we actually talking about? There, he was the first prime minister. He ruled for 17 years unquestioned. And he is, this is not the only wrong thing he has done. The, the Americans offered you the United Nations Security Council seat uh, with a veto in yes. place of China, because China had become communist. So they threw them out and said, you take it over. And Jawaharlal Nehru said, no, morally, this is this uh, the seat of the people of China. And now it is ruled by the People's Republic. They should get it. And for, till from 1949, 1950 to 1971, when the Americans finally handed it over to the Chinese, uh, that is the People's Republic of China. We kept on advocating year after year in the United Nations that it should go to him. Now, that kind of mentality where national interests, we can be sacrificed because you have some moral commitment. Address what needs to be done, I'll tell you. Yeah. The first foremost thing that needs to be done, and I've been saying this for years and years, is make the most appropriate uh, modern compliant uh, change in the educational system. The garbage that yeah. is being taught in our uh, in our uh, uh, schools and colleges is unbelievable. I'm not only talking about history, I'm talking about economics. When I first came to IIT and started giving a course in economics, and I did it with mathematics, these engineering students were were thrilled because they knew mathematics, and it was so much easier to understand. But even today, if you go to colleges, they're drawing graphs, which is 17th century economics. Supposing in micro in microeconomics, if I say, I raise the wages, what will happen? Yes, the demand for employment will go down and the employment will go down. But what happens if I lower wages in the macroeconomic, then the purchasing power of the people goes down and therefore demand goes down. Therefore, the businesses go out of, uh, you know, bankrupt. And therefore, there's more unemployment. So lowering of wages will actually lead to uh, more uh, un unemployment. And that's how the depression, which they couldn't change for five years, couldn't get rid of. Finally, John Maynard Keynes suggested 
print mm -hmm. notes and build roads. Thank you very, very, very much. Uh, wonderful to be with you. Happy Independence Day to all of you. Let's take pride in our country and let's do our bit to help the country. Whatever we do, if we can say, how is it going to help my country and put that thought before how is it going to help me? I think uh, that that is the small place where all of us can collectively start, irrespective of what we think. I think that is something we can all agree on. Thank you very, very much. Right. Happy Independence Day once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Swami.